Hello, everyone. Uh, thanks for joining us. My name is Melody Chua. I'm a musician based in Zurich, Switzerland. Hi, and I'm Benjamin Whiting, a composer based in Orlando, Florida. And together, we are the co-founders of Null State, a nonprofit music technology organization. If you would like to learn more about what we do, please feel free to visit our website after the concert. It's www.nullstate.org and we'll drop a link in the description after the event. So this event is pretty special to us um, because it's the first time that we will be doing our live coding concert on YouTube. Um, we've done live coding concerts before in the past, um, plenty of them, but they've always taken place inside a concert hall. So for example, Benjamin might be in Florida performing in a hall, and then I would be performing also, but across the Atlantic Ocean in Zurich, and we would sync our computers so that we're able to play the exact same concert, um, but being many, many miles apart. Um, but this time, our concert hall is virtual, obviously, it's on YouTube. So this is a really kind of unique experience for us because this allows you, the audience, to be uh, I guess it's directly involved in, in some ways. Um, in this way, um, we would invite you to ask questions. So you can see on the right hand side of your screen, there is a chat window. And here you can type um, any questions that you have about what we do, what live coding is, what is electroacoustic music, basically anything that you would like to ask us. Um, and you can do that during the concert or even after our jam during our Q&A session. And during our informal chat after the gem, we will try to answer your questions as best as we can. So we're really excited for this because hopefully this is a chance for you guys to learn something new if you're not familiar with live coding. And it's also a chance for us to be directly engaged with you guys. Yes, and uh, before we begin, I wanted to, uh, or we feel it's important to just give a very brief overview. We'll go into more depth after the event is over, but regarding what you're going to be seeing unfold and hearing unfold. So on the screen, if you look at the uh, left side of your screen, you'll find what looks like a big blackened text box. And inside this box is where I'm going to be writing my code. So uh, the code that you will be seeing on this side of the screen will be my contribution to the jam. However, on the opposite side, in a similar looking text box, is Melody's contribution to the jam. So you'll see the code that she's typing in. And uh, the purpose of the code that you'll be seeing has to do with the uh, creation and processing of the sound, excuse me, the sounds that we're going to be using in the jam. So. Uh, pay attention to what you're seeing. See if you can't, during our improvisation, try to, to divine how we're creating and uh, and manipulating sound. And then if you have any questions, like Melody said earlier, uh, please don't hesitate to type them in the chat during the performance. We'll do a, another uh, like uh, overview of what you heard after the performance. So uh, in case uh, there's something that we don't cover, also uh, please ask. And uh, before we begin, if you haven't visited our website already, uh, please do so. The link is in the description below. Uh, and also feel free to not only uh, subscribe to this channel, Null State, uh, but also check out our Facebook page. Uh, like that, uh, follow it, please. It's The link is, again, in the description below. Um, and uh, also before we begin, if you happen to have earbuds or even better headphones nearby, we recommend that you plug them in and listen using them because it will be the optim optimal listening experience. A lot is gonna be lost if you use like, for instance, your laptop's built-in speakers. So uh, yeah, but we hope that you enjoy.
Thank you.
All right. Well, I hope you enjoyed our, uh, our inaugural li live stream uh, performance of live coding. So let's see. Uh, I see. <laughs> yeah. Thanks, Enal. <laughs> and uh, all right. Oh, Chase, that's a good question. We'll. Uh, Let's see, do we communicate by way outside of watching each other's screens during the performance? Uh, well, actually, Melody and I do have a separate, uh, um, like we basically call ourselves over the service called Kakao Talk, and we use that to talk to each other while the stream is going. So our uh, instructions to each other or conversation doesn't uh, infiltrate the stream. But for the most part, we don't talk. I think we, Melody, I think we like said like two things to each other the entire time. <laughs> <laughs> just asking like, you know, if uh, I think one time was just asking about like, uh, I don't know, something incidental about the tempo. And then that was, a, and then like, oh, and then are we ready to end? And I think mean, that was it. Yeah, I think that's one of the advantages of having the setup, um, of having a virtual concert hall, because we could really, like if we really wanted to also, say more things to each other and coordinate more things like okay like let's apply this effect in three two one <laughs> and <laughs> you can't yes. really do that of course in a normal setting so no. yeah. so yes good question um well if you can think of any more questions please feel free to uh to ask in chat uh keep in mind there is actually a little bit of a delay so while we see the text right away because of the nature of youtube live sometimes uh, it might seem like we're taking our time to get to it but uh trust us it's actually just more of the latency in the stream and not that we are just waiting and <laughs> deigning to finally get to your answer question at some point in the future uh so before uh, or while, in case you have any more questions, uh, while you're thinking of anything else to, to ask, uh, we thought it'd be cool just to go into a little more uh, depth as far as our setup. So now, uh, for those of you 
uh, watching the stream that is, are wondering, so Benjamin, you say you're in Florida. Melody is in Switzerland. Uh, you're nowhere near each other. How is your code then affecting Melody's uh, uh, computer all the way in Zurich, and how is Melody's uh, code getting to your computer? Well, the answer is we're using a slightly modified version of this extension to the Super Collider programming language, which uh, is what we're using to code in, called Utopia. And Utopia is an extension that basically allows multiple computers on the same network to talk to each other. Um, now, it, it opens up the possibility of that kind of communication. However, it doesn't deal with the execution of code. Uh, I actually added this little method to the, to the extension called remote eval. So we, uh, in our setup, we executed this. And so by doing that, uh, we're having the code, like, like for instance, I'm getting Melody's code, it's being logged, and it's being evaluated. So that's like the missing piece of the puzzle. Um, so that is uh, kind of the meat and potatoes of our setup. Uh, we have, of course, in the setup, we each have a setup file. Uh, it includes a sound bank um, that we draw upon. And uh, this, if you're wondering what it was that we were typing in during the concert, it's what you see here. So like, for instance, uh, you'll see me do invoke this method called play on this mysterious named variable called tilde grainy. And uh, that actually is referring to an effects processor that I had set up in the setup file. And I'm feeding this called a belly for lack of a better name, but it's a, a sound that emulates or a physical model that emulates the sound of bells. Uh, if I played that straight, it would just sound like bells are playing. But I'm patching that in using this syntax with the less than, greater than, greater than sign. So that means this is being fed into the grainy effects processor. And uh, every now and then you might see me changing some parameters using set or X set. Uh, and with X set, it calls upon this other parameter you'd sometimes see Melody and I enter called fade time. So this deals with crossfading. So for instance, with this polymorph sound, I set its crossfade to 10 seconds. So whenever I made an alteration to its sound, it would the old version would fade out and the new version would smoothly fade in over a 10 second period, thus leading to a smooth uh, transition. Um, yeah, so this is uh, more or less what's going on over here. Melody, would you like to take over and talk about some of your unique setup? Yes. Um, so Ben and I share some similarities, but also many differences in our setup, um, even though we're live coding on the same platform. Um, one similarity is that we're both using sound banks, like sounds that we've designed ourselves and we prepared ahead of time. Um, but you see here in the setup, I have all these things that uh, I need for my code to work, um, but I don't type them out during the performance because it would take way too long and we would already be uh, well into the evening <laughs> or afternoon, depending on where you're watching. Um, before I finish this. So what Ben and I both do is prepare a bank of sounds, which we've named. Um, you can see that every time there is this tilde and then a name that's referring to one of our sounds. Um, and we just designed them here. And then in the jam file, we call upon them, we transform them, we say play or stop or adjust the frequency or adjust the volume. Um, and that's a really common scheme with how we do live coding, preparing a bank and then manipulating them for the concert. Um, and what you see in my jam uh, file here is the way that I was uh, manipul the main way that I was manipulating my sounds uh, is through applying patterns or looping a certain command every uh, uh, every couple seconds or so. Um, and you see this in the block of code here. It's called the tdef. And basically, I'll take this as an example. What I'm do doing is taking the gend sound and then setting the frequency out of a set of uh, a list of frequencies that um, I have already. And then I just say that uh, please wait two or three se seconds. You can choose and then do it again. And I'm doing this loop. Um, multiplied by all of the sounds that I have. So I'm basically taking um, 
loops for all of my my sounds and each loop is like very slightly different maybe i'm calling upon a different set of frequencies to um to cycle through but otherwise it's kind of the the same scheme um but that's not just all i'm doing a lot of uh what i'm doing with the sounds is also happening kind of um behind the scenes in, in a way that you can't see what i'm doing uh because I am also using MIDI controllers. And what you can see is actually the, the post window over on the right. It's basically a log of all of the data that's going through my, going from my MIDI controller to my computer. Um, and I have a MIDI keyboard on the side to set pitches for what I referred to earlier, like the set of pitches. I can, for example, uh, type um, or I guess play on my keyboard a C minor chord um with a, a seventh and you can see the, these pitches filled in uh, this array in midi value or yeah in midi note numbers and this is basically what um my sounds will call upon this is this list and it's just much faster than to type out and also memorize the midi note numbers for each of the pitches um it's a lot more intuitive so i also yeah prefer to do a lot of transformations externally through a MIDI device. And then the second device that I'm using is called uh, Touch OSC. Maybe some of you have heard about it. It's a program that's available uh, for Android and also for iOS. And it allows you to create a touchscreen interface on your phone so that you can um, manipulate sounds just by, by sliding a slider or um, panning a pan pot, like you can really customize the interface. And what I put on there is a kind of mixer interface. So I can fade in sounds, for example, um, you might even hear it, uh, this distant clang sound, or actually, no, maybe not because we- No, I, I've already quit the server, so. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, maybe, uh, yeah, maybe when you watch back on the screen, um, whenever I fade in a sound, um, you can see, you can start to see the stream going here. You can see these values going up and up and up and up and up. And um, because it's a, a, a MIDI device, it goes uh, 0 to 127. And that, you can see, is the, the volume. So um, for me, I, I like this approach because I have the combination of the live coding, but also the flexibility to play a bit more spontaneously through external devices. So yeah. Yeah. That's my All right. So uh, hopefully, uh, Chase, you know, all uh, our other viewers are still here. Um, well, again, if you have anything to ask, please do not hesitate to do so. Uh, while we're still, uh, the event's still going on, I thought it might be cool just to go into a little bit, because there's one thing I forgot to mention about our remote setup. So, <clears throat> excuse me, um, as you see here, I already went over Utopia and, and how that is allowing our code to be executed on each other's machines. But there's one thing I failed to mention. Uh, Melody and I are have to be on the same network to send our code over. Yet Melody's in Switzerland, I'm in Florida. We're hardly anywhere near each other's Wi-Fi routers. So how has this come to pass? Well, if you've noticed in the top right of your screen, or of the screen, uh, you may have witnessed this strange little timer that kept counting up. And what this is, is it's showing uh, the elapsed time that we've been connected to a VPN, or a virtual private network. So in our quest to be able to do our intercontinental live coding performances, we, uh, for a while, we had a VPN set up in my house, but that proved to be far less than uh, reliable. So we went ahead and uh, are renting a virtual private server. On that, uh, I set up an open VPN instance. And uh, the servers held this big data center in Atlanta. Uh, and we're using this company called Linode. And uh, yeah, this has been extremely reliable for us. So basically, I send my data to uh, Melody through this data center, and she does the same. Because we're both connected to Open OpenVPN in this data center, we think we can see ourselves on, on the same network, even though we're uh, continents apart. Uh, in the setup file, 
we, uh, as you can see here, I have this IP address, which uh, is, of course, um, if, if you don't already know, uh, and apologies if, for those of you who will roll your eyes, uh, but yeah, this is basically the uh, identifier that's used to, uh, to categorize uh, machines or like devices on a network. So we gave each other static IP addresses. This is what Melodies is using. And no, you can't just uh, log into this IP address right now and try to like take over her computer. Uh, you got to log into the VPN first. Uh, sorry to burst your bubble. Um, but yeah, by inputting that, that way all of the code from both of our ends are sent uh, to each other reliably. Furthermore, um, yeah, that's uh, or I guess it's about it. I I guess yeah. Melody, yeah. anything you'd like to add? No, I think um, while we're waiting for new questions, mm -hmm. um, this is a good time to um, ask you all to subscribe to our YouTube and Facebook pages um, because we have a couple of events coming up and. The Facebook page, especially, uh, is the the place to really find all of our latest announcements. Uh, but what is exciting um, for our YouTube channel is that we will be releasing a series of tutorials for electroacoustic music, um, starting with Super Collider, which would be headed by Ben. And once that season of tutorials are over, I will continue uh, with releasing tutorials for visual programming on Max and Jitter. And these tutorials will start on Tuesday and one video will be released each week. So we're really hoping that uh, we can give this to you guys and um, so that you don't miss it, please subscribe to our channel. And yeah, you'll always be in the loop for that. Um, yes. Furthermore, we have also the second annual Kalos Flota Commission Competition where we ask um, does any comp or any composers who write electroacoustic music to submit their works for instrument and electronics for a chance to win $1,000 and also uh, an opportunity to create a new piece for the Chaos Flute or the Sensor Augmented Flute if you don't know, uh, if you're not familiar with the project already. Um, last year, we had the great uh, honor of awarding Howie Kenty the prize and it was really a pleasure to work with him because he had never written a piece for the Chaos Flute before. Um, so it was good for us to know how to, um, I guess, explain the instrument to him, for him to have his inputs uh, and be really creative with what he already knows about composing for instrument and electronics. And it resulted in a premiere of his piece last, last June. And we hope to do the same in this year's competition. Um, because it's just a lot more fun to have other composers writing for the instrument uh, besides just Benjamin and I. So that deadline is coming up on January 31st. Yes, a week from today. Exactly. And it's already an extension from our original deadline. So it's really the last call for scores. And we're looking forward to reviewing what you submit us. Absolutely. And it seems as if Scientific Sound in the chat asks, what is the latency like with the VPN connection? Well, I'm glad you asked. It's uh, with our previous solution, it was actually not that bad unless we were both performing off site. In which case, I did notice a bit more latency. However, with our current solution, it's negligible. Uh, a big reason for that is, for one thing, the uh, the uh, transfer speeds, like the bandwidth open to us at, uh, using this service, uh, Linode, is quite generous. I can't remember the exact uh, uh, upload versus download, but it's 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 way better than my home connection. Uh, furthermore. What we're sending to each other is just code. Like we're not streaming audio or anything. So uh, we only need the, to send like like just a few bytes, um, and on, and we only really send these packets uh, when we execute code. So it's it's really it's it's quite negligible. Like I'll watch Melody on her side of the screen. I'll see uh, she's changing like something on her MIDI controller. I can see the post window, uh, like for instance, increasing, like the amplitude increases, uh, at least this is the first value. And I will hear it increasing on my end, like almost instantaneously. So it's it's quite good. 
It, it hasn't been a problem for us. In fact, occasionally we do have issues with dropped packets, but um, since we've moved to this new service, it's not like, I don't, I don't, Melody, can you remember a time where we've had an issue where you'll execute something and I don't get it or vice versa? Because I remember that used to happen with our old setup quite often. Yeah, it used to happen way more often, but I think uh, now it happens maybe once every, I don't know, 20 times that we jam. Yeah, it's, it's, seems it's like a high percentage, yeah. but it's actually a lot better than what we used to have. Yeah. And really, I don't think there's a, uh, like for what we're doing, it, it's not something that some big company has already developed a system for. We're kind of going through a lot of back doors and repurposing things to make it work. Um, so yeah, we're, we're always working on getting it smoother and lowering the latency, but um, right now we're at a point where it's uh, working for us pretty well. Yeah. Great. Well, um... I guess I we'll guess. we'll uh, keep the line open for any more questions. Yeah. Um, but I think now is also a good time to discuss some common questions that we usually get um, just outside of these live coding con contexts. I agree. Um, one of which is that we've been asked, what kinds of challenges have we encountered while performing and collaborating from this uh, great uh, distance with Ben in Florida and me in Zurich? Um, and Ben will elaborate, especially more on the technical side of uh, the setup and the kinds of headaches that we've encountered with our, our previous arrangements. Um, as for me, a lot of the challenges revolve around scheduling um, rehearsals and also concerts because of the time zone difference. Uh, we really have to plan in advance oh, yeah. how we're going to. Uh, I mean, every for concerts, as well. Yeah. yeah, exactly. That we we both work, we study, and uh the concert time in florida or in everywhere is usually in the evening and if we have a concert late at night in florida then it's really really late at night for me and i think i've i mean even with giving lectures remotely i've i think stayed up past midnight before for for those kinds of things um so yeah it's a lot of planning in advance um yeah and just just making sure that we <laughs> we're, yeah, we're smart about the time zone difference. Yes. Um, yeah, I think I, I pretty much uh, preemptively went over the majority of our issues as far as the technical side is concerned. Um, you know, before we tried this VPN setup, we actually briefly uh, attempted to do a, this. I don't know if, if anybody is familiar with text editors or specifically the Atom text editor. It has, there's a, a particular package called Super Copair, which combines this collaborative coding environment, and I apologize, I forget which package, like individual package that is, with the Atom-based Super Collider plugin, and uh, we found like the latency was really bad there, so uh, we chose it to the point where it was corrupting like the sound, or like for instance, we'd type and and like just the amount of time between our keystrokes and when the letters would appear on the screen was just way too much. So we quickly uh, booted that idea out the window. Uh, we've tried other options, as I had mentioned a little while previously. Uh, we were using uh, the Mac OS X server.app to host our VPN for a while uh, before we we got our current solution um, via Linode. And uh, yeah, that we ran into problems. Not so much that the that server.app is not robust. I mean, OS 10 has uh, rather good, I mean, it's, it's a Unix-based operating system. It's no worse for networking than any other Unix-based operating system. But the problem is, is that with a VPN was hosted inside my house, with a residential internet connection, that led to some real white knuckle, I mean, that's what we had to do for like the first over a year that we were doing intercontinental live coding. But there were times where like, for instance, I would be performing at a venue outside of my house. Melody, of course, would be in Switzerland. And uh, I just had to hope and pray that the VPN was still running or like we didn't have a power outage or, or just it just didn't stop running for some, reason because I could not go back and restart it. Uh, so, you know, just these kinds of logistics, it's, uh, 
you know, it's one of those things where it's like you might think, hey, you know, it, it seems like this is doable with in this day and age with our networking solutions, but uh, uh, no, it's it's not super cut and dry. Shoot, even the the remotely executing code thing, like I had to come up with my own extension. Like I had to uh, go into a Utopia and add this because there was not a solution pre-built in any of the uh, super collider extensions that would allow for remote code execution outside of like. I know open object has it, but we'd have to completely restructure how we code uh, to take advantage of it. So it just, um, you know, we had, I had to just, you know, do that. And so it, it, it was a lot of steps to get to what, where we are today, but thankfully uh, it seems to have paid off as we've uh, our for the most part our rehearsals and our performances now are, I don't want to jinx anything, but they, I won't say they've been problem free, but they have been problem light. Yeah, I think that it, like going in this direction uh, was definitely a good decision because I guess one of the alternatives would be to uh, try to sync our audio streams and jam that way and like not just sending code to each other but sending audio and that just takes up way too much data and we have we would have a lot more latency issues. Um, so I think that's also one of the advantages of doing live coding, if especially if you have two people that are living that far apart or collaborating that far apart, um, that we're able to create a lot of noise <laughs> with not yeah. a lot of data. <laughs> so, yeah. Good. Well, cool. I think, uh, Melody, is there anything else you would like to bring up before we end our um, session? Today? Not unless anyone else has any other questions, but it looks like it's about time to wrap it up. Yeah. Last call. All right. Okay. Well, uh, unless I see somebody with a last minute question as I'm speaking now, I want to, well, both Melody and I would love to thank you once again for tuning in. Um, again, if you haven't already, please like and subscribe to our channel. Uh, <laughs> you're welcome, Chase. Uh, please uh, follow us on Facebook. Uh, we even have an Instagram, although the link isn't in the description. I forgot to, to post it. Um, but uh, at least uh, follow us on Facebook to stay on top of all of our events, uh, including the first in our series of Super Collider tutorials coming on Tuesday. Um, yeah, so. Oh, and then our call for scores. The deadline is a week from today. We would love it to have as many people apply as possible. Uh, and we would love to get to know your works more and then choose who will be the next to write for our sensor augmented loop. Yes, so thanks, everyone. It was really a pleasure to jam for you all. Um, <laughs> yes, exactly. Um, and, and really, um, as you can tell, this is like kind of a, a new thing, well, definitely a new thing for us, but I think also a new thing for the industry to do live coding on YouTube. It's a really complicated setup. So um, it's really cool that you guys are part of this experience with us and that we're able to share it with you guys. So, so you're part of the OG crowd. <laughs> yes. Uh, so we'll see you guys on the next event and stay tuned for further announcements on our Facebook and YouTube. See you.